all, you all ready? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody, how is everybody this morning? Good. Good, excellent. Welcome to the uh, morning session on pinkwashing beyond LGBT. I'm uh, Tim McCarthy and I teach at uh, Harvard University where I run the Sexuality, Gender, and Human Rights program at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. And it's my great privilege and pleasure to be here this morning, not only with all of you, but with these four distinguished panelists. Uh, let me uh, tell you how we're going to sort of run things today. Uh, each of the panelists will deliver their paper um, uh, to you, and we'll, get, we'll do that in turn. I'll introduce all of them at the very beginning, and then we'll just sort of go uh, in line, I guess, uh, starting with Samantha and then moving on down uh, this way. And then afterwards, instead of me giving a kind of academic response to these papers or a kind of uh, co an academic conference-like uh, response to this. I thought it would be best at this conference, uh, following some precedents from yesterday, to actually open it up and have a discussion right away with the audience. I have lots of questions and comments that I could offer, but I'll sort of save them for when things there's a lull in the conversation. So uh, I doubt this is a conference where there won't be many questions afterwards. So, and you're all here for that. So I'm going to uh, dial that back and, and and offer that space. So. Okay, let me uh, just introduce all of my colleagues here. Uh, Samantha King, who will be presenting a paper on imperial charity, pinkwashing, and the politics of breast cancer in the Middle East, uh, is an associate professor of kinesiology and health studies at Queen's University, and she works on the cultural politics of health and the body. Uh, Sam Markwell, uh, to my immediate right, is a master's student at the University of New Mexico. Uh, he's just finishing up a research project on early 20th century settler colonial improvement projects in the middle Rio Grande Valley. Valley. Uh, to my immediate left is Ryan Thorison. Uh, oh, and he, his paper will be uh, on paper pink and greenwashing the settler colonial biopolitics of scrubbing Israel and the United States. That's the title of his uh, presentation. Ryan Thorison, to my immediate uh, left, uh, is a doctor, uh, did his doctoral research at Oxford University and also worked in close collaboration with the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. Uh, that research is uh, the basis for uh, his paper today on negotiating solidarity in practice, transnational NGOs, and the partnership principle. Uh, and Ryan is uh, currently a law student uh, finishing up a degree at Yale University. And then uh, Ayla Schoenwald uh, is uh, studying human rights education at the University of San Francisco. Before that, uh, Ayla studied post-colonial anthropology, and she also has been a longtime activist uh, in the BDS movement. And uh, Ayla's uh, paper today is called Pinkwashing, uh, Karmit's uh, Progressive Pioneers and the Ongoing Zionist Colonization of Palestine. And so we will begin, Samantha, with you. Thank Great. you. Well, th thank you, uh, Tim, and thanks to the organizers of this uh, amazing event. Fashion writers like to say that pink is a versatile color. Judging by the multiple and sometimes competing political uses to which it has been put in the past two decades, they may have a point. In the case of breast cancer, pink has been central to the branding and corporatization of the social movement around the disease. The mobilization of non-contentious, vapid public awareness and the erasure of a whole spectrum of experiences that don't fit within the tyranny of cheerfulness that defines contemporary breast cancer culture. As resistance to social inequalities, environmental racism, and the medical industrial complex has been driven from the mainstream movement's agenda, breast cancer has become what Adweek called a dream cause, which can be attached to a seemingly infinite range of concerns, both corporate and governmental, including, most recently, the interests of the US and its allies in the Middle East. In what follows, I offer an account of how breast cancer activism came to be appropriated by a free market feminism working on behalf of an imperialist foreign policy. Exploiting rather than securing women's health, this particular manifestation of pinkwashing works in concert with military and market intervention at the same time that it conceals them. Like Israeli pinkwashing, it trades in images of modernity and it does so in ways that bolster the concerns of the US and its autocratic allies in the region. In order to understand how breast cancer came to be understood as an appropriate vehicle by which to advance U.S. interests in the Middle East, it is necessary to reflect on the emergence of the disease as a philanthropic cause par excellence here in the United States. 
Over the past three decades, large foundations, multinational corporations, and government agencies have worked together to reconfigure breast cancer from a stigmatized disease, an individual tragedy best dealt with privately and in isolation, to a neglected epidemic worthy of public debate and political organizing, to an enriching and affirming experience in which women with breast cancer are rarely patients and mostly survivors. In the latter of these three configurations, the breast cancer survivor emerges as a beacon of hope who through her courage and vitality has elicited an outpouring of corporate and consumer generosity, a continued supply of which we are led to believe will ensure that the fight against the disease remains an unqualified success. The sometimes farcical nature of this phenomenon reached new heights in 2010 when I came across an advertisement for a breast cancer gun a blacksmith and Wesson nine millimeter pistol with an awareness ribbon engraved on its slide and an interchangeable bubble, bu bubble gum pink grip. Uh, the saving lives by taking lives logic of the pink ribbon pistol seems only slightly less mind boggling when one considers that over the past two decades, millions of people have become enthusiastic consumers of a slew of potentially harmful pink ribbon items ranging from cosmetics to household cleaning products uh, to gasoline. Breast cancer has become the consummate free market feminist cause, to use Chandra Mahanti's term. Like all good practitioners of free market principles, the breast cancer industry has begun to pursue initiatives in new geographic locales as it seeks to expand its markets not only for breast cancer treatments, the fruits of pharmaceutical research, and pink ribbon products, but for a particular ideology about the disease and how it should best be approached. Major players are involved. AstraZeneca, the maker of best-selling chemotherapy drug tamoxifen and the creator of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, uh, the Coleman for the Cure Foundation, and cosmetics uh, giants Avon and Estee Lauder, uh, which since 1999 has pursued its global landmarks illumination initiative by bathing tourist sites like the Leaning Tower of Pisa in pink lights during the month of October. Sites in the Middle East have included the Burj Al Arab Hotel in Dubai uh, and the old city, oh, the pyramids at Giza and uh, the old city uh, of Jerusalem. The latter two, the pyramids and the old city, are actually illuminated by the Komen Foundation, uh, which is this huge competition in the breast cancer industry uh, between foundations and corporations. They're basically all corporations, so between Komen and Estee Lauder. And so Komen has recently entered the pink lighting sector uh, to try and get that market share from uh, Estee Lauder, their competitors. Within this context, the US Middle East Partnership for Breast Cancer Awareness uh, marks the US government's first foray into transnational breast cancer policy. Announced in 2006, this public-private venture is a sub-project of the State Department's Middle East Partnership Initiative and involves corporations and non-governmental organizations such as the Coleman for the Cure Foundation, the Avon Corporation, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, a, a huge range of cancer care and business organizations, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, in the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Yemen, and Palestine. Uh, this photograph was taken at the Sheikh Khalifa Medical Center in Abu Dhabi in October 2007. And you can see Laura Bush, who is the program's ambassador, meeting with Emirati breast cancer survivors on the first of two <coughs> breast cancer diplomacy visits to the region uh, at the end of, or towards the end of George W. Bush's second term in office. The Breast Cancer Partnership has resulted in the creation of a number of programs, including the dubiously titled Making It Our Business Campaign, in Dubai, uh, which has the dual aim of saving lives and, quote, enhancing the concept of corporate social responsibility, end quote, by encouraging companies to launch awareness programs and to offer free screening to employees, despite the fact that Dubai already has in place a free mammography service, which, like other aspects of its healthcare system, is open to foreigners as well as locals with no identification required. Uh, similarly, the Train the Trainer program, now operating in the UAE, Dubai, and Jordan, teaches employees of multinational corporations to spread the message of breast cancer screening at work. Participating companies include General Electric, which is, as well as being a weapons manufacturer, the largest manufacturer of mammography equipment in the world, General Motors, and Johnson & Johnson, with the official goals of mitigating the effects of breast cancer on participating companies, employees, and customer bases, 
and demonstrating the importance of public-private partnerships. That's actually a quote from the mission statement. So this project from the beginning was not just about promoting breast cancer awareness, whatever, whatever that is, but also public-private partnerships uh, and cause-related marketing. In addition to helping launch these campaigns, the Komen Foundation established a program named Course for the Cure, which invited women from four Saudi Arabian cities to come to the US to, in Laura Bush's words, learn, quote, all the things that Komen does in the United States, the pink ribbon, the races for the cure, all the ways that the word gets out to remind American women to be screened. Back in the Middle East, the number of breast cancer awareness events has mushroomed since the launch of uh, the partnership in 2006. Although most of the official partnership activity is concentrated in the Gulf states, the Komen Foundation has been busy at work in Egypt and Israel. They've also been busy at work there. They held their first Middle Eastern Race for the Cure event in October 2009 among the pyramids at Giza, which were illuminated in conjunction with General Electric. Uh, this is Nancy Brinker, who's the founder and CEO of the Komen Foundation. Uh, the event was announced internationally through a press release claiming that Komen was expanding its global breast cancer mission to Egypt, end quote. By working under the patronage of Suzanne Mubarak, then First Lady of Egypt, the Breast Cancer Foundation of Egypt, the Suzanne Mubarak Regional Cancer Center for Women's Health and Development, the Suzanne Mubarak International Peace Movement, and the United States Agency for International Development. Official documents also note that Egypt was selected by Komen because of its, quote, need relative political and economic stability and the willingness of its high-ranking officials and government officials and many non-government officials to work together in building capacity to address its high breast cancer mortality rates, end quote. The Egypt Race for the Cure was supposed to become an annual event sponsored by Samsung, and it did take place in 2010, but it has not been staged since the revolution. The first Race for the Cure in Israel took place in 2010, organized through a partnership between Coleman, the city of Jerusalem, and Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. The route took participants around the walls of the old city. The event was widely covered and, uh, in the words of historian Ellen Leopold, mindlessly celebrated within and outside of Israel as an event that is, quote, bridging the gap between cultures. Uh, and that was a quote from uh, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. His, uh, Ellen Leopold noted in a letter to the JTA that their coverage created the impression that Palestinian women from the West Bank or Gaza were involved in the race when they were very likely not. Rather, the event included some Israeli women, that is, citizens of Israel. Leopold argues that the suggestion that the Komen event generated mutual goodwill not only blurs the distinction between Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza and Arab Israelis, it also ignores the discrimination against the latter within Israel itself, which makes access to quality medical care problematic for many Arab Israelis. While discourses of breast cancer awareness about Arab women within Israel and the Palestinian occupied territories have have been focused predict predictably on stigma and shame. Within the hegemonic messaging, no mention is made of the carcinogenic tungsten shrapnel and dye munitions that have saturated the land with toxins and poisons since the Israeli assault on Gaza in 2008 to 9. Nor is acknowledgement made of the fact that Palestinians referred for cancer treatment to Israel must obtain a permit to enter, and that delays, refusals, and expirations of permits are common. Moreover, if Palestinians opt or are forced to go to Egypt or Jordan for treatment, they may find that their prescription medication is not licensed, licensed in Israel, which controls pharmaceutical licenses uh, for the occupied territories. Um, as revealed in uh, this powerful report by Who Profits, um, the Coalition of Women for Peace. In their essay, Medicine as a Tactic of War, Palestinian Precarity, Annie Finkster, Marsha Rosengarten summarized the implications of the situation as follows. It is the maximizing of this disease, and they're speaking specifically of cancer here, such that the sufferer is uh, lured to seek access from the state that has already placed them in a position of dependency and ultimately death. At the same time that breast cancer awareness papers over violent injustices, it also advances a particular ideology about how populations should be structured and governed. 
The public-private mandate of the partnership, for instance, works to promote individual and corporate philanthropy as morally and economically viable and preferable means through which to respond to needs in place of the state's role in mitigating the destructive effects of capitalism. In an increasingly privatized public sphere, civic commitment is to be expressed not through critical engagement with structures of power, but with privately sponsored educational and research initiatives. As critics such as Isla Jad, Shahzad Mohab, and uh, Nala Abdo have argued, the professionalization and institutionalization of Arab social movements and the infiltration of nonprofit organizations into multiple aspects of everyday life over the past two decades can be directly linked to recent US military interventions in the region. Uh, and they, uh, these authors cite uh, massive increases in the number of US-based NGOs operating in the region. Uh, and uh, the Brookings Institute also uh, issued a report that uh, showed that annual US democracy aid in the Middle East, it's called democracy aid, was more than total, in, by 2009, was more than the total amount spent between 1991 and 2001. Wow. While in diplomacy and development circles, NGO projects like the Breast Cancer Partnership are promoted as, as equivalent to positive social change, NGOization has unleashed a heated debate in the Arab world. In Jad's words, quote, they have been viewed as a new and growing form of dependency on the West and as a tool for it to expand its hegemony. Indeed, while the Middle East Partnership Initiative, the umbrella project of the Breast Cancer Initiative, was launched by then Secretary of State Colin Powell in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq with the goal of, quote, deepening our long-standing commitment to working with all peoples of the Middle East to improve their daily lives and to help them face the future with hope, end quote, a 2005 Congressional Research Service report on the partnership suggested that large sectors of the peoples of the Middle East had not responded well to the initiative. Although a handful of governments, Morocco, Bahrain, Qatar, and Yemen, welcomed the funds, others, such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Oman, were less enthusiastic. Meanwhile, the unofficial response, particularly as it was conveyed through the press in the region, was largely negative. An editorial in the Beirut-based Al Safir newspaper, for example, claim that the purpose of MEPI was to link, quote, the ambitions of some people in the Arab world to the objectives of the United States, not the objectives of the United States to the ambitions of people in the Arab world, end quote. One year after the publication of the skeptical congressional report, the breast cancer awareness program was rolled out, with Laura Bush at that point the subject of an approval rating 30% higher than that of her husband as its figurehead. During her visit to the Middle East to promote the program, Bush spoke to a group of students about the project and, quote, asked them not to believe everything they watch on TV or hear about the US, end quote, and expressed her hope that the partnership would illustrate for Middle Easterners the, quote, positive character of US culture. In addition to propagandizing for US interests, bringing this depoliticized, corporatized, and individualized version of an issue into play in contexts such as Egypt and Palestine helps further undermine the work of feminist social movements that have already been compromised by what Hanafi and Tabar refer to as an advocacy workshops and training programs approach to mobilizing women. Catherine Frankie also alerts us to how such strategies work to pathologize local cultures. She writes, foreign support for the Palestinians in the form of money, aid workers, and teams of experts, myself included, that's herself, not myself, uh, pour into Palestine <laughs> seeking to improve the lives of women Millions of dollars, euros, or yen are easily available so long as gender rights frame the scope of work. But by gender, the donors really mean women. Just as with gays, Palestinian culture is understood as toxic and dangerous. Thus, Israel traffics in gay rights to pinkwash its international reputation, while the donor community estrogen washes virtually all of its work in Palestine. In both cases, the backwardness of Palestinian culture and tradition justifies the intervention of others to save its women and gays. Pro-woman but not feminist, empowered but not enraged, sisterly but not collective, and thoroughly disarticulated from questions pertaining to sexual identity, racialization, colonialism, or class dynamics. The culture of US breast cancer survivorship represents a potent export in the current geopolitical climate. If NGOization results in a situation whereby so-called women's issues are presented as if they are suspended in air, disconnected from other interests and needs, the US version of breast cancer awareness came with such disconnection embedded within it, like a built-in guarantee of sorts. 
While the selection of breast cancer as a diplomatic tool was well thought out and intentional, it had very little to do with the complex realities of women's health and the place of breast cancer therein across the various locales in which the partnership operates. This is not to suggest that breast cancer is a non-issue for women in the region, but rather to point to the lack of evidence that leaders of this partnership actually pay any attention to figuring out what women's health concerns might be or where breast cancer fits into their priorities. In this context, the partnership might be viewed as contributing to a culture of breast cancer risk in the region, and hence to building an expanded market for the breast cancer industries. What we are witnessing here, to sum up, is the appropriation of breast cancer activism by a free market of civil society feminism articulated to an imperialist part foreign policy. This policy aims not simply to wage war in the name of promoting formal liberal democratic institutions or unseating select autocrats, but is focused on advancing and consolidating the values and practices of individualism, the free market, and private property. In this iteration of imperialism, intervention is justified less often in terms of responding to and routed at, routing out terrorism, and more frequently in terms of the need to enforce democratization, modernization, economic empowerment, and other vaguely defined ideals exemplified in the practice of corporatized breast cancer philanthropy and awareness. The Comer <coughs> Foundation and their allies in the corporate sector work with the state to promote values and practices which are legitimized through the renormalized idea that empire represents a plausible and proper basis for hope, stability, and democracy. Moreover, they do so largely with impunity on the domestic front as social norms plague charitable works above, beyond reproach. Proponent, proponents of breast cancer awareness repeatedly claim that breast cancer is external to the realm of politics and transcendent of economic concerns, racial thinking, or gender and sexual norms. Such renderings rely, however, on the erasure of power relations that undergird awareness. And in this context, it's vital to make visible the forces of exploitation and exclusion that structure breast cancer campaigns and the pinkwashing through which they are enabled. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha, very much. Uh, Sam, you're next. Yeah. Okay. Switch, yeah, maybe yeah, switch. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's here. Thanks to the organizers and fellow panelists. Um, as you can see, I've changed the title, which I tend to do. <coughs> oh, <right. laughs> <All> right. um, <clears throat> so much of this conference is elaborating the meaning and stakes of pinkwashing, what is commonly understood as the use of a gay rights agenda to obscure the settler colonial violence of the Israeli government or imperial violence more broadly. I argue that pinkwashing is a strategy within a broader project that uses progressive demands for protection to alibi state violence. I place the use of corporate and state appeals to benevolent environmental protection, what is being referred to in some circles as greenwashing, alongside the use of, a gay, of gay rights rhetoric as part of the biopolitical strategies of modern colonial states. As such, I want to consider the emergence of greenwashing <coughs> and its ethical and political implications. To offer a preliminary definition, Greenwashing and pinkwashing are tactical logics of, of scrubbing that do aesthetic and effective work of making imperialism and settler colonialism sensible and secure through normative and naturalizing frames. This paper is organized into two parts. The first traces the emergence of the term greenwashing in the Anglophone lexicon and the ways in which it has been deployed in political intervention and critique. Uh, this first part outlines the typology of greenwashing and critiques of greenwashing as problematic. The second section focuses on the ways that critiques of greenwashing, when applied to Israeli self-fashioning, can generate a provisional solution and important rejoinder to problematic circulations of greenwashing and green criticism. The point of this paper is to extend the rejoinder queer critique directs at U.S. Global North progressive LGBTQ politics and pinkwashing to geographically related progressive environmentalist politics and greenwashing. In so doing, I'm calling critical attention to the modes of making live, letting die, and enforced killing shaped through imperial and settler colonial regimes of biopower, and the ways progressive activi uh, activisms are generated by or folded into these regimes. In focusing my critique on the conditions and limitations of activist critiques of greenwashing, I follow Foucault, who explains that, quote, my point is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous, which is not exactly the same as bad. 
if everything is dangerous, then we always have something to do. So my position leads not to apathy, but to hyper and pessimistic activism. <laughs> <laughs> the point here being that the stakes of critique are not so much to identify the bad and somehow remove oneself from it, and so sort of creating a separation. And in so doing, remove oneself from the spaces of implication and accountability. Rather, it is to understand the complex networks in which wrongdoing and violence take place and circulate, and to not excuse oneself from the potential calling to responsibility and accountability. Upstate New York environmentalist Jay Westerveld takes credit for coining the term greenwashing in 1986. Westerveld first used the term to critique the cards in hotel bathrooms that encourage customers to reuse towels in order to reduce resource use and help save the world. The term has since come into common usage to describe corporate advertising and charity that displays environmental consciousness, coding capitalist interaction with the world through consumerist imagery of sustainability and natural balance. As such, greenwashing was called out for being oriented solely towards profit making without actually having a significant effect on environmental well-being. These criticisms flourished in connection with specific ways of living which gained currency in the late 20th century as the environmental movement based largely in the global north raised awareness about the ecological degradations caused by universal or global categories of human activity or human behavior. The focus on the universal human at work here fueled the movement's Malthusian tendencies that portrayed contemporary matters of environmental concern in the image of third world population growth overtaking northern security. For instance, in the 1980s and 90s, racist Malthusian logics influenced Sierra Club and other environmental groups' policy agendas. Many of these groups called for the institution of systems of global population control, more rigid control of migration across the U.S.-Mexico border, and the exclusion of poor communities of color and indigenous communities from forest and grazing land use under the pretense of saving wilderness and averting the tragedy of the commons. Jay Kosak, Bruce Braun, and Alexander Ministern have detailed the troubling entanglement of whiteness and environmentalism in the U.S., revealing how the imposture of speaking for a universal nature under threat from global human behavior or activities enables projects of sexual and racial policing by those who assume, in, by those who assume the position of universal authority. To understand these forms of environmentalist and green political consciousness, Lauren Ballant's definition of hygienic governmentality is useful. <coughs> Berlant defines this governmental mode as, quote, a ruling bloc's dramatic attempt to maintain its hegemony by asserting that an abject population threatens the common good and must be rigorously governed and monitored by all sectors of society. For these environmentalist organizations, the common good of the planet and the security of a national future become, or became obsessively defined against carefully fabricated figures of the threatening illegal immigrant and the burgeoning multitudes of third world poor. Rather than focusing attention on the logic and logics and structures of capitalist production and circulation, this governmentality worked to make certain racialized bodies and populations hypervisible as threats to the security enjoyed by the citizen consumers of the U.S. and other developed nation states. Another aspect of progressive northern environmentalism is marched in line with the neoliberal shift, fostering the reduction of policy, politics to consumer preference. During the past few decades, the notion that environmental ethics are lived by purchasing and consuming green products led to activists and the environmentally conscious to accuse certain corporate, uh, corporations of greenwashing. In this framework, the accusation of greenwashing is raised against a few bad apples who are not really green, allowing for the elision of systemic problems with capitalist production. Michael Pollan has encouraged this mode of being green, proposing that the lack of political avenues to effectively address green concerns can be countered by people accepting such conditions and just, quote, voting with their forks. Um, presumably, once everyone starts voting with their forks, only those producers who are really green will find consumers for their products. While these tendencies do not exhaust environmentalist politics, there are definite limitations on its possibilities. Emerging from this northern environmentalist, environmentalist milieu, the term greenwashing was, regi was registered in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1999, defined as, quote, disinformation disseminated by an organization so as to present an environmentally responsible public image, unquote. Investopedia, a financial investment education website founded in 1999, defines greenwashing as, quote, when a company, government, or other group promotes green-based environmental initiatives or images but actually operates in a way that is damaging to the environment or in an opposite manner to the goal of the announced initiatives, unquote. 
To summarize, greenwashing is delimited as problematic only because of its disingenuous greenness, which presumably could be resolved if only companies and governments would really just authentically go green. Following the 2005 Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, journalists, activists, and NGOs began to discern and criticize the greenwashing practices of Israel in ways that call into question whether greenwashing is really the root of the problem and whether a genuine greenness is really the solution. On May 4, 2010, an Israeli investment event was held at the Boston Museum of Science. The title of the event was Israeli Innovation, Healing the World Through Technology. This event is part of a broader set of investment conferences organized by Israeli and U.S. economic development agencies <coughs> through which capital and consumers are attracted to Israeli state and private projects. Boston BDS activists organized a demonstration outside the museum, picketing and unfurling an enormous Palestinian flag from a nearby bridge. A handful of activists entered the conference, passing out modified programs and interrupting speakers by calling attention to Israel's genocidal practices. The vocal activists were promptly removed from museum grounds by security guards. Alternative programs, which there's an image of one page of it here, um, interrupted the logic of global benevolence that was harnessed to Israeli state capital collaborations, pointing out the ways that the basis of Israeli wealth and health is grounded in the dispossession and subjugation of Palestinians. The cover of the program identified the proceedings as, quote, exhibits and presentations on colonization and ethnic cleansing technologies and death sciences innovation being developed and perfected in Israel, unquote. The original program listed a talk by Dr. Ilan Adar, director of the Zuckerberg Institute for Water Research, titled Israel's Experience with the, with the Middle East Water Shortage, Sustainable Development, and Managing of Cross-Borders Water Resources. The alternative program changed the title of the talk to Strategic Water Appropriation, Might Makes Right, reframing the premise of sustainable resource management within the project of settler state appropriation. Another talk given by an Israeli investment advisor titled Investing in Israeli Technology was changed by activists to an investor's perspective, why you should stop worrying about an international boycott and keep buying bombs. Channeling Dr. Strangelove, this re reframing captures the ways that investment in death-producing technologies is framed as an act of national love. In addition to changing the titles of talks, the alternative program listed the sponsors of the event with critical biographies. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee, Committee was described as a Zionist organization that deploys racist discourse against Palestinians to shape the U.S. Um, foreign policy agenda. The Jewish National Fund was called out for its role in redistributing expropriated Palestinian land to Jewish and Israeli settlers. Um, the JNF's, um, and so here's some, these are images from the Palestinian Poster Project Archive from uh, the, the early 20th century, sort of capturing those images of how, how tree planting is really vital to the sort of Israeli project of colonizing Palestine. Um, the JNF's project of planting trees was characterized not in the self-fashioned terms of cultivating wilderness or green reforestation, but as a tactic of obscuring villages from which Palestinian communities have been forcibly expelled during the Nakba and subsequent expropriations. Um, and this uh, poster on top, uh, some of the text reads, you know, setting down roots here and showing that sort of form of uh, community building and, and making land claims that's so central to formation of Israel. In this way, the anxieties that arise from taking one's place by displacing others are disavowed or soothed by covering over the signs and traces of prior and alternative Palestinian cultivation of lands and putting signs of settler counter-sovereignty into circulation. Um, here's another map that, that says, from a wasteland to a settlement, showing the, the rolling back of this you know, primitive wasteland of uncultivated, uncultivated land into an organized ordered settlement. Um, that's a mid-century image. Um, this is a, a picture of Safaria. So Safaria, in, prior to 48, is pictured in the, the foreground. The background is what it looks like nowadays. It's been turned into a tourist park. Uh, that focuses on archaeological sites that have almost nothing to say about Palestine and everything to say about pre-Palestinian Jewish roots. 
Um, the Boston BDS activist practices partake in what Jacques Ranciere describes as the political and aesthetic disruption of an entrenched distribution of the sensible that polices what is visible, thinkable, and sayable about the Israeli regime and its relations to land and life. Through such political interventions, greenwashing is identified with the normalization of Israeli settler colonization of Palestine, and the possibility that Israel could in fact become legitimately green is decentered as the most pressing matter of concern. Instead, greenness and sustainable development of resources can be discerned as perfectly in line with securing the Israeli regime. So it is not just the valorized greenness that is at stake, but the, secu the security and expansion of the regime that relies on the dispossession and subjugation of Palestinians. Moreover, it is not just the Israeli settler regime that is made available for critique, but Israel and a network of transnational capital investment and geopolitical alliance with the US, a role model from which Israel has derived and adapted much of its settler colonial repertoire. The shift that critiques of greenwashing are undergoing when applied to Israeli settler colonialism crucially open up facets of the exploitation of living beings that are elided or even called for in normative environmentalisms. By centering settler colonialism, the critique of the capitalist corporation and the apolitical subjectivity of the consumer can be shifted to attend to the modalities through which bodies and lands are incorporated, recognized, and assimilated by settler state and social formations. In so doing, the ethical and political horizons of criticisms of greenwashing are made more expansive and capacious for struggles over social and environmental justice in Israel, the U.S., and elsewhere. Foucault, in the final chapter of Volume 1 of The History of Sexuality, describes the emergence of modern technologies of power as resulting from a shift from a sovereign privilege to kill and take life to a power that subsumed death production into its drive to, quote, invest life through and through, unquote. And what are greenwashing and normative environmental critiques of greenwashing, if not powers in the service of settler, settler colonial investments in life? If this is the case, as I have argued here, then greenwashing and pinkwashing need to be urgently centered as tactics of scrubbing that normalize imperial and colonial violence as the intrinsic and, and unsurpassable means of achieving the ends of living. And it is just such a concept and practice of living that must be refused, decentered, and displaced through queer heterotopic decolonial political imaginations. Thank you. And I also I forgot to show these slides. This is um, the American Bicentennial Independence Park that was um, created on lands donated by the JNF in 1976 to commemorate American independence. And um, here's some photos of walls, probably you know either from villages or or um, Past, you know, pastoral structures of uh, grazing and that sort of stuff. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, here's some, okay. some more JNF. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sam. Ryan? Sure. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for putting this together and thanking all of you for coming uh, this early in the morning. Um, my paper differs a bit from the rest of the panel because my work has focused on LGBT activists and especially on the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, or IGLHRC. Um, for today's discussion, I'm interested in talking about this idea of partnership in international work and the work that it does in LGBT advocacy, but also in other sorts of solidarity efforts. So in order to avoid being or, or appearing imperialist, activists in various movements speak of partners in the global south. The term partnership is ubiquitous in development, human rights, and social justice, but the actual meaning and practice of partnerships vary widely. The full version of this paper asks which groups Igelherk identified as partners, how and why, explores the stumbling blocks that arose in partnerships, and discusses how activists sought mutuality and solidarity when partnerships faltered. I'm happy to talk about any of that afterward, but in the next few minutes, I want to focus on the complex relationship between partnership, pinkwashing, and homonationalism. I want to suggest that at its best, partnership can operate as a structural mechanism to resist both homonationalism and pinkwashing. For groups in the North and in the South, partnerships locate political accountability with queer comrades elsewhere in the world rather, th rather than with one's own government or co-nationals. Partnerships have challenged Northern activists to think critically about the homonationalist positions of their own governments and to take a skeptical position on hate crimes legislation, aid conditionality, or the neglect of other sexual rights like sex work and abortion. As an ideal, partnership can help forge trans-border queer alliances and problematize blind allegiance to the nation state. At the same time, partnerships are not forged or practiced in a vacuum and are necessarily shaped by disparities in power and privilege. 
partnership resists unthinking allegiance to one's own nation state, but it's hardly blind to one's citizenship and geopolitical position. In practice, both partners are often defined in large part by their location in and affiliation with a nation state. When Northern and Southern partners lobby in supranational spaces, for example, the nationality of those involved is regularly mobilized as a symbolic and political resource. Worse, when these relationships are not scrutinized, the rhetoric of partnership can itself serve a pinkwashing function. Simply calling a relationship a partnership says little about its content and dynamics. When deployed uncritically, partnership can imply a solidaristic relationship between queer equals while obscuring the real disparities in power and privilege that exist in a post-colonial world. In the brief time I have today, I want to talk about some of the problems that the concept of partnership can paper over and about what this means for transnational solidarity efforts more broadly. So what did partnership mean for the activists with whom I worked? Partly in response to post-colonial development and queer critique, the rhetoric of partnership was often used by northern and southern groups to signal a commitment to cooperation and mutuality. And activists at Igelherk expressly attempted to operationalize this ethos. As a matter of policy, they only produced calls to action with the approval of in-country groups. They relied on their partners for up-to-date information and guidance. They turned to their partners first and foremost when they were offering funding, bringing groups to conferences or summits, or developing funding proposals for joint work. At Igelshirt, her partnership followed from the edict to do no harm and was supposed to be both non-directive and mutually enriching. Nonetheless, the rhetoric of partnership still left a great deal to be negotiated in practice. Despite daily references to partners and partnership, these concepts were far from defined at Igelhart. Activists recognized that they worked with individuals and groups for various reasons that were blurred by a catch-all term. Their strongest partnerships were built on a long history of collaboration and trust. Activists at Igelhart had previously worked in domestic movements in Argentina, the Philippines, Uganda, and elsewhere, and they maintained ties to those movements. Other partnerships that they forged were motivated by an impetus to engage in movement building and were explicitly designed to fund, legitimize, or support emerging groups. Still other partnerships were forged, particularly in crises, when activists felt compelled to work with any in-country group visibly working on LGBT issues, which were often deemed the only game in town. These rationales shifted, but they justified working with a range of partners. Igelherk's partnerships were much less formal than the contractual, resource-intensive partnerships studied by development theorists. Still, activists took them seriously enough that objections from their partners could shift their strategies or scuttle their interventions. For that reason, I want to focus the bulk of my time on the complexities of partnership and how activists actually navigated it in practice. The partnership ideal was stymied in practice for a number of reasons. Often, partners were unable or unwilling to respond to communications, especially during crises. Partners could also be disinterested, give ambiguous answers, or agree to campaigns so half-heartedly that Igelherk opted not to pursue them. In many cases, the stumbling blocks were more predictable, and five of these were particularly salient. The first complication was when there were no partners who were evident to activists in the global north. So one of my first tasks at Igelherk was to finalize an unfinished report on LGBT issues in Senegal. And the original draft had been written by a Cameroonian staffer who had unexpectedly left Igelherk and left the report languishing for a year before I arrived at Igelherk. In that time, the Senegalese LGBT group with which the activists had worked had disbanded, its leader had passed away, and many of its members were in exile. So the week before the release of the report, the absence of known partners left Igelhurt vulnerable to criticism from in-country stakeholders. HIV AIDS groups expressed concern that a report from a US-based <coughs> LGBT organization would reignite latent tensions in Senegal. Igelhurt was eventually confronted with a chorus of opinions, some from Senegalese HIV groups that were not queer identified, some from northern expats and queer Africans who were living in Senegal, and some from transnational actors that made it unclear who the relevant stakeholders were, but expressed real concern about the report. Many activists at Igelhurk felt that there were some valid reasons to release the report, like highlighting the experiences of queer women in Senegal who were not necessarily represented by MSM organizations. Nonetheless, they readily agreed that they couldn't responsibly release the publication. With no clear partners to guide the final launch and navigate these different opinions, <coughs> Igelherk indefinitely shelved a report that they had spent two years and upwards of $10,000 to produce. A second complication arose when, partnerships needed, when partners needed the partnerships to be covert. So Igelherk's action alerts, letters to governments, reports, and submissions to the UN were often highly critical of governments. They were designed with the cooperation of in-country groups, who were typically identified in these outputs to show that the demands weren't merely those of a foreign NGO. When these types of outputs work, it's typically because naming and shaming generates moral and political outrage. 
which when agents of the state gain power by denouncing LGBT rights, they often backfire. So in many contexts, groups had good reason to downplay their cooperation with the US-based LGBT human rights organization. Igleherk's own staff were often critical of the standard model in such instances, when funding and security, and not publicity and protest, might have been most helpful to their partners. Of course, concerns about publicity weren't static, but were dynamic and situational. For many years, Igleherk worked as, with a public health and human rights NGO, the Center for the Development of People, as Malawi's most credible voice on LGBT issues. In late 2009, when Tuwange Chimbalanga and Stephen Manjeza's arrest made global headlines, activists and journalists around the world quickly labeled CDEP a gay rights organization. The conviction that CDEP re represented LGBT people in Malawi, which was cultivated by activists in calmer times, was relied upon by northern groups who genuinely wanted to take their cues from partners in Malawi. It became a liability for members in CDEP, however, who balked at the publicity, scrutiny, and demands that they suddenly faced as they were internationally recast as a gay rights NGO. A third difficulty arose when the values, politics, and standards of Igleherk's <coughs> activists differed from those of their partners. Although northern activists were genuinely opposed to imperialism in many instances, they held other normative commitments just as strongly. When partners didn't share these, they often generated tension that wasn't necessarily predicted in the partnership. Organizationally, Igleherk's activists stress concepts like representativeness, accountability, and good governance that are lionized in northern NGO management. Ideologically, they generally shared values that are recognizably progressive in the US context. So Safet Igleherk uh, supported a range of sexual rights, including sex work and access to abortion. Most were deeply skeptical of the centrality of marriage, hate crimes legislation, and military service as goals of LGBT advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, such belief inevitably shaded partnerships, for example, in the ways that activists negotiated commitments to inclusivity. Activists at Igleherk valued inclusion across the LGBT spectrum, that is, not only representing gay men, but also lesbian, transgender, and bisexual persons. At times, national representativeness and these other values were put in tension. The earthquake in Haiti in January 2010 devastated the office of Sarah V, which was Igleherk's in-country partner. Activists strongly supported sending aid for Haiti's LGBT communities. Sarah V was Igleherk's close partner in Haiti, but it worked specifically with MSM, and pretty much only with MSM, and thus staff members also sent funds to a feminist group in the Dominican Republic that could convey aid to LVT women. Weeks later, however, it was Sarah V, as Igleherk's partner and a Haitian NGO, that received the much larger relief fund and was invited to co-sponsor a project on LGBT rights during times of crisis. In this instance and others, partnership offered a way of working across north-south power differentials but it didn't necessarily offer clear guidance when other normative commitments, for example, to gender parity, were added to the mix. A fourth stumbling block arose in countries where partners and agendas were multiple and often conflicting. Increasingly, a range of groups advocate on behalf of LGBT persons in any given country. In a crisis, activists instinctively turn to those with whom they have worked in the past or those that are visibly identified with LGBT issues to the greatest extent. That often threatened to prevent them from engaging new actors with different assessments of issues, tactics, and strategy. The politics of partnership in a crowded field were evident in Igleherk's interventions against the anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda. The legislation galvanized a range of groups into a civil society coalition on human rights and constitutional law. Igleherk worked with the coalition, but primarily coordinated with SMUG, its most trusted partner in the country. SMUG guided Igleherk's advocacy from a day of international action against the bill the response to Lou Engel's inflammatory evangelical rally in Kampala. When money for the coalition was tangled and unable to be dispersed, Igleherk directly wired funds to SMUG to enable it to continue its advocacy work. In Malawi, Igleherk similarly liaised with CDEP rather than the Center for Human Rights and Rehabilitation, which was the first group to publicly address the case and ardently supported the couple. CDEP was Igleherk's trusted source of information about the couple's status, Chimbalanga's gender identity, and the preferred spelling of her name, and advice on what interventions were or were not helpful. The choice had tactical consequences at various points. When the couple was pardoned and lawyers in Malawi wished to challenge the law, the underlying sodomy law in which the couple was arrested, Igleherk deferred to CDEP's wishes to focus on resettling Chimbalanga, refocusing on their work, and letting the case go. What this means for partnership as a principle is complex. As the field of actors expands, it raises questions about who the relevant partners are and who they represent, under what conditions northern groups might break with them, and how activists might incorporate or synthesize advice from a range of relevant players. A fifth and final complication arose when potential partners were self-sufficient. 
Eagleheart's lack of response to anti-gay violence in Kenya is perhaps instructive in this regard. During my fieldwork, religious leaders called for the Kenya Medical Research Institute to be shut down for providing services to homosexuals. Over the next few days, mobs assembled there and attacked individuals in incidents in Mutwapa and Mombasa. The potential victims in many of the incidents were taken into protective custody by police to keep them from being injured or killed by the crowds. The mobs were widely reported in the international press, and Human Rights Watch released a public letter to the government demanding a stop to the, quote, anti-gay campaign. Igleherk, in this instance, was conspicuously silent. Behind the scenes, the violence had sparked a standard response at Igleherk. The director of programs contacted the Africa Program and the Gay and Lesbian Coalition of Kenya, or GALC, a partner with whom Igleherk had worked closely in the past. New York was inundated with inquiries from the press, and frustration was palpable as time zones, conflicting reports, and silence from Kenya and South Africa made it difficult to grasp the facts, what could be said publicly, and what, if anything, would be helpful. Eventually, Galt confirmed that they planned to work on their own, liaising with police to set up response mechanisms for LGBT people at risk. They said that intervention from Igleherk would be unhelpful, and it was unclear what role Igleherk could independently play in reporting these types of events as they occurred in Kenya. The growth of regional LGBT networks has further complicated any ideal of North-South partnership. The problem becomes acute when regional networks are ill-equipped or reluctant to work on issues that Igleherk's partners and Igleherk whether they're activists or groups, are eager to work on together. In these instances, a simple north-south dichotomy is often insufficient. The multitude of regional networks involve multiple players with different affinities, priorities, and capacities, and partnering with one of them can effectively foreclose the possibility of partnering with another. These five difficulties created tensions, but they also highlight how northern models of partnership tacitly depend on stable, visible, compatible, credible, and willing counterparts in the global south. As activists adjusted to situations where this was not always the case, their responses suggest that stumbling blocks in partnership aren't fatal, but do require deeper thinking about what meaningful partnership requires. So in order to avoid being totally irrelevant to the sort of beyond the LGBT element of the panel, um, I want to conclude with some thoughts about what this all means beyond the LGBT. Um, I think when used uncritically, partnership can serve a pinkwashing function by downplaying very real differences in power. When it's taken seriously, though, it can also be a useful tool for activists who are committed to accountability and solidarity with people outside their own political domain. Those of us who are deeply skeptical of homonationalism and pinkwashing often have transnational affiliations and solidarities of our own. An interrogation of partnership is a useful provocation for all of us who are committed to some normative vision of justice, but are also committed to advancing that vision humbly, self-critically, and responsibly. First, I think there's a need to unpack the discursive dimensions of partnership and the ways that the term can blind actors to the power dynamics of relationality across difference. I think it's notable, for instance, that many of my queer informants at Igleherk also refer to their significant others as their partners. For them, partnership had strong connotations of mutuality, responsibility, longevity, and trust, and its uncritical use in advocacy runs the risk of simply presuming that these traits are present. Other dynamics might be presumed if one spoke instead of allies, colleagues, comrades, or brothers and sisters. So what does partnership mean to both parties? And for that matter, what do we imply by calling our efforts a campaign or a coalition or a movement? Second, I think there's a real question of who becomes partners, how, and why. A range of ideologically diverse groups work on any issue, from LGBT advocacy to the BDS movement. Activists have a natural tendency to affiliate with those whose ideologies align most closely with their own. And in many cases, those who speak English, use social media, have bank accounts, or otherwise assimilable to a particular style of activism. In this sense, there are no transnational affiliations that are simply neutral. When we say we take our cues from our comrades elsewhere in the world, who do we mean, who do they represent, and which of our own values do we interpose in our relationships with them? The central question follows on that, what partnership and other political affiliations should mean in practice, beyond simply signaling a desire to take cues from people abroad. The concept of partnership has utility as a means of working more responsibly by grappling with the historical and political repercussions of post-colonial dynamics. It needs, however, to be analyzed alongside other axes of difference and the difficulties that emerge when it's negotiated on a day-to-day -day basis. Partnership tends to set a baseline for what not to do. Don't unilaterally intervene from the North without the consent of Southern activists, for example. What it doesn't do is resolve urgent questions about who does and should constitute a partner what partners owe each other, and how advocacy might proceed in the face of real disagreement. If partnership is to be enriched and rehabilitated, conceptually and politically, these deeper questions of political responsibility require attention, 
and self-critical reflexive work on our own various movements and solidarities is indispensable to that end. Okay, Ryan, thank you very, very much. And Ayla? Okay. I very much appreciated some of that JNF um, PowerPoint imagery, which I did not put together, but I do speak a lot about the JNF. Yeah. So people can just recall those images and imagine that they're up on there. That'd be great. Um, so my paper is actually not exactly titled the right. same as yeah. it was. Um, it's car I, the word pinkwashing is no longer in there. So it's Karmit's Progressive Pioneers and the Ongoing Zionist Colonization of Palestine. According to a Jewish National Fund flyer, quote, Karmit will be a modern, diverse, and progressive community. However, the JNF has functioned for centuries to facilitate, enact, and maintain the Zionist colonization of Palestine, and Karmit is no exception. What in this context is the meaning of diverse and progressive? When, why, and how did these terms come to be associated with modernity in this context? Proponents of Karmit suggest as well that the settlement has been successfully depoliticized, that it is free of the political tension and conflict that characterizes most West Bank settlements. Its patrons talk about sustainable living and upscale housing with an organic grocery store down the road and several art galleries nearby. Karmit promises prospective settlers the chance to live the pioneering life in luxury. I'm not going to even bother to put quotes around everything because I would just be like this the whole time, so <laughs> I think you can just read the sarcasm in my book. I will begin this paper with a concise exposition of Kamit and Blueprint Negev, contextualizing both as components of Israel's rebranding initiative, a marketing campaign designed to improve their public image in the West, especially amongst men ages 18 to 35 and liberals, presumably of all ages and genders. I will identify and explore some of the signifiers of modernity and progress deployed by the JNF and other organizations in their promotion of Karmit and other blueprint negative settlements. I will discuss the role of the Jewish National Fund in the ongoing colonization of Palestine and specifically in the Nakab or Hebrew Negev. The final section of this paper might be described as a brief methodological excursion into the realm of Foucauldian genealogy. It is an attempt to conceptualize a history of the present in relation to Karmit and some of its discursive components. Zionism, European colonialism, U.S. supremacy, and U.S. imperialism, global capitalist development, and liberal and neoliberal political culture, among other things. There's not quite time, that's why it's the <laughs> excursion. Um, this paper will address and engage these issues in the context of Karmit, not just as a place, but as a project, a plan, and part of a much larger picture. So, the first section is Karmit, an emblematic icon of a brand and a blueprint. Official descriptions of Karmit characterize the settlement as, quote, modern, diverse, and progressive, a, uh, quote, new model of modern Israeli living, end quote. The portrayal of Karmit as a luxurious and liberal community is intended to differ differentiate this new model from the majority of West Bank settlements, which are now widely perceived as a place for religious zealotry and heated political, con political conflict. These attributes are considered antiquated in the neoliberal present. Neither can be appraised as an effective marketing technique. Blueprint Negev is a plan devised by the Jewish National Fund to extricate the Israeli state from this predicament. Karmit is the first of the Blueprint Negev settlements, and although its construction is not yet complete, it has already garnered a great deal of interest and financial support from its target demographic, wealthy, young, entrepreneurial North American Jews. Karmit and Blueprint Negev are, emblem are emblematic of Israel's rebranding project which many scholars, including Jesper Puar and Sarah Shulman, have discussed at length in relation to the Israeli state practice of pinkwashing. Puar describes Brand Israel as a, quote, campaign to counter Israel's growing reputation as the colonial power. Through various market research studies and expert inquiries into dominant Western perceptions of Israel, not only as a nation state, but as a brand, the Israeli state was disappointed to find that their popularity is waning. They are no longer afforded complete impunity and can no longer expect entirely unconditional support. Although many Westerners, especially in the US, continue to support Israel, many of them also see the Zionist state as religious, militaristic, and altogether unlike themselves. In a documentary guide to brand Israel and the art of pinkwashing, Shulman relays the words of David Sable, one of the marketing professionals involved in the campaign, who states that what consumers want to see is a, quote, productive, vibrant, and cutting edge culture, end quote. And that is precisely what Karmit exemplifies. 
Israel's rebranding initiative, then, is an assertion of similarity or sameness between Israel and other Western states. Many of the researchers and policy experts commissioned by the Israeli state have repeatedly asserted that the creation of a new image is not enough. Israeli policies must begin to shift as well. Activists would suggest that much more than just Israeli policies have to shift. For the most part, however, Israeli officials have dismissed this as unnecessary and chosen to focus instead on the fabrication of another national mythology, another narrative through which they will seek Western support, not only in the form of military aid and economic investments, but also as recognition, acceptance, and legitimacy. So the next part of the paper is a general section, actually it's three sections um, about different colonial continuities. Um, the first one is early Zionist assertion of belonging within the West and the ongoing role of the JNF. No, that's the third one. That's the first and the third one, sorry. The second one is pioneers, blooming deserts, and other discursive tactics of displacement. And I also wanted to include a section about specific, about displacement specific to the Bedouin of al -Nakab. Um but that would require its own 12 minute presentation and I, anything that I tried to do is completely reductive and so instead of including that, I'm going to point people in the direction of publications by Badil, um, which is an organization, um, and Nadira Shahu Kevorkian, and there's also a series of ebooks on the JNF that you can find if you can't find, so that's, that's, and possibly that will, be another paper in the future. Mm -hmm. All right, so early Zionist assertion of belonging within the West. Although the Israeli state was not established until 1948, the Zionist movement began much earlier when the significance and centrality of the nation state in global politics and governance was still on the rise, and when the majority of European nation states were competing for colonies in other regions across the global south. In 1896, Theodore Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, established the World Zionist Movement and wrote and published a brief text entitled The Jewish State, where he expressed his belief that Jews could only attain protection from persecution if they were granted sovereignty over a nation state of their own. According to Herzl, this could only be accomplished with European support. Thus, political Zionism from its inception has been necessarily closely aligned with the European colonial elites. In return, Herzl promised that the Zionist state would, quote, form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. Thus we can see that the Zionist project, even before the establishment of the Israeli state as a settler colonial society in Palestine, has asserted its alliance and alignment with the West, both as an abstract entity representative of civilization and modernity, and in the form of particular nation states to whom Zionists have turned for political, economic, and military support. Blueprint Negev is a contemporary, modern version of this strategy. Um, now on pioneers, blooming deserts, and other discursive tactics of displacement. According to dominant discourse, Zionism is the promise and the embodiment of Jewish liberation, achieved through assimilation into the order of dominance through the creation of its own powerful militarized nation state and its production of subjects with a deeply embedded affective and political loyalty to that nation state. The spectacular abilities of the brave, strong, and muscular Zionist pioneers constitute another significant component of Israeli mythology. And these iconic images are also employed by the JNF and other Israeli organizations in relation, relation to this phase of their colonial project. We are told that these men came upon a land that was not only uninhabited, but uninhabitable, a dry and dangerous desert. Through the implementation of innovative Western technologies and modern agricultural techniques, however, these early settlers made the desert bloom, the storytellers say. The trope of the blooming desert remains prevalent in Zionist discourse today and is often understood both as a testament to the settlers' superior te technology and agricultural skills, implicitly rendering the Jews as superior people, and as evidence of an intimate and authentic relationship between the Jewish settlers and their new unfamiliar foreign home. The ongoing role of the Jewish National Fund. Blueprint Negev is not the first project designed for the purpose of colonizing or even developing al Nakab or the Negev. In 1948, JNF official Yosef White stated, quote, the Hebrew state will have to embark on a wide settlement strategy in its first three years. In the Negev, we'll be able to implement immediately, or not, our development laws, according to which we shall expropriate land according to a well-designed plan. These words could just as easily apply to the JNF's colonial endeavors in the Nakab today, and the similarity is not simply a coincidence. It is evidence of continuity in the Zionist conquest and expropriation of Palestinian Bedouin land. The diverse community of Kermit is in fact located in the northern Nakab, 
where it is surrounded by Bedouin villages. Even the JNF acknowledges that there are 160,000 Bedouin currently residing in the Negev, half of them in villages unrecognized by Israel. Recently, the JNF and the ILA, Israel Lands Administration, have been trying to, quote, encourage, i.e. coerce, <coughs> the remaining, quote, nomadic Bedouin communities to settle in cities and stay off the land they want to populate. This encouragement includes regular demolitions of Bedouin villages, such as al araki This is not the conclusion. This is not a conclusion of any kind, but I call it a conclusion because it's the end of the paper. So, <laughs> uh, it's inconclusive, very inconclusive. Um, we cannot dismiss the JNF's attribution of the term visionary to their blueprint Negev campaign as a simple demonstration of their arrogance, although it is that as well. Long-term strategic planning has never been a weakness of the Zionist movement. They have certainly demonstrated their ability to envision and subsequently achieve that which seems to be impossible and even absurd. Unrecognized villages, present absentees, etc. The Zionist project has always been organized around the promise of return to a past that never really was. Kermit, too, is replete with impossible and contradictory promises. The only return that actually takes place in this context is the return of many of the romanticized notions and glorified tropes that were also implemented by the early Zionists when they first arrived in Palestine and for a long time afterwards. Again, we are told there is an empty land, barren and desolate. Perhaps in this case, now, the claim is not completely untrue. The Nakab is not empty, but it has been and continues to be emptied as the indigenous Bedouin are forcibly displaced. The land itself was not always barren, but like the homes of the Bedouin farmers, it too has been bulldozed. Those bulldozers and those who gave them the orders brought fictional history to life through the dissemination of violence and death. Thus, material reality aligns with national mythology only as a result of state policy. Okay, I wanted to thank uh, all four of the panelists for amazing papers and a lot of food for thought. And I wanted to open this up now for uh, discussion. And if you, when you uh, raise your hand and ask a question, if you could please ultimately formulate it as a question, ending with a question mark, that would be great. Uh, uh, otherwise, we don't have any more room on the panel. Uh, but I, uh, And also, if you could identify yourself and just say who you are and where you're from, that would be good, too, so we can begin to know each other a little bit in the room. So who wants to begin with uh, questions of these great papers and panelists? Oh, come on now. No one has any questions about any of these papers. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my name is Rachel. I'm from Oakland. I don't have an affiliation anymore. I graduated. Um, Oakland's, Oakland's a pretty cool yeah, affiliation. That's a cool affiliation? That's yeah. A cool affiliation? Yeah. Okay. yeah, why not? So um, in response to Sam and Ayla, um, one thing that I was thinking a lot about during your presentations about um, the JNF and about expansion and these things is the link between um, colonization and gentrification, um, and especially the gentrification of Tel Aviv and South Tel Aviv. I'm wondering if either of you have done any research on that. Like, and it's also clear here, like the link between colonization and gentrification in this country. So, if you want to talk a little bit about that, that would be yeah, cool. Great. You want to start first, and then have Sam. Um, I can definitely say that I don't have much. I've I have a lot more experience with and, I guess, experience organizing around gentrification in the US. Um, and that is a link that I think is definitely also important to make. Um, and that I think it's exciting that people are making that link, mm -hmm. often by building alliances and partnerships, though there are also all kinds of issues that arise when that happens. Um, but I think I, one of the things that I, one of the components I wanted to discuss actually in this paper was a sort of US specific brand of Zionism, brand, it's not an intentional use of the word brand, but um, a US specific sector or maybe brand of Zionism um, in which it makes sense for us to look specifically at the US and not necessarily, not that we shouldn't also study Israeli society in all of its detail, but what do we do, those of us who don't have those those links or connections and experiences, how, how are we also looking at our own 
So, but I don't have anything actually answering your question. Yeah. So. Same. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just agree <laughs> um, with what you're pointing at, and, and uh, say that yeah, gentrification is really useful to think of gentrification as a mode of colonization. Um, to sort of bring into relief the sort of historical dynamics. I think it's also, when we think about gentrification um, and finance and, and wealth and that sort of thing, it's, it's useful to think of the ways that uh, finance is a mode of colonization, like, operates as a mode of colonization as well, and, and of sort of ascribing value and worth or worthlessness to places and people and that sort of stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, responses. Um, I think also one of the one of the other topics I discussed in the paper was the um, the unrecognized villages, um, and so I think just even looking at like the what is I would be curious to know what is the relationship there between those communities that are being not only it, I, is is it only a difference in scale in terms of the destruction that's happening there and gentrification in South Tel Aviv? I have. No idea if that is, but I would sort of right. just bringing those into the same conversation. I think would be interesting to sort of see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Dialogue. Um, just because, like, there's a lot of public housing, clearly, that's being pushed into like settlements, and so I didn't know if you all talked about. Public housing for for, for Israelis and okay. so the displacement of of uh, Israelis who don't have a lot of money, usually Mizrahi Israelis, become the displacers of other people. Alicia. Hi, um, I'm Alicia. My affiliation is JVP and Boycott from Within. Um, I have a question. Um, there's like a theme woven in between all your papers about how there's a convergence of like Zionism mixed up with this international development discourse and practices. And in a way it makes it much harder to talk about because it's very confident to talk about international development projects and how it's wonderful all, all over the world. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about kind of how to deal how to deal with this and like Israel effectively is able to hide this Zionism from its projects by marketing like blueprint negative as an international development kind of program. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. I'm just curious about your thoughts about that. All right, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, well, if you want to all sort of respond to that because um, all the papers touch on that. So why don't we just go down the line? Yeah, I mean, I guess real real quickly, I think that it's I mean it's. In some ways, it's obscuring Zionism or aspects of Zionism, but it's also um, forgetting what organization made this image. But there's an image of uh, uh, forests that are plant forests that are being planted in the in the Gev, and um, it says like this is Zionism. So it's not trying to hide it. It's saying like this is Zionism. We're we're planting forests and like fighting desertification and making these resources available for wealth production. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I think it's really important to sort of. Like what's important is to point out what's what's really problematic about Zionism and to not just sort of let it sit as this you know, beneficial thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I would say the same thing, that, you know, that the our job is to um, reveal where, where these forces are, are at work. Um, and of course, there is this this huge resistance to NGOization, uh, but... Uh, it's hard when so much of the economy is also reliant mm -hmm. on it, right? And it employs people, and so, ha you know, uh, it's a it's a really difficult uh, situation. But I think those of us who are not um, stuck uh, in in quite the same way have a responsibility to talk about that. Yeah, I think that a big part of it um, come. I mean, I, I think that there are in any sort of like. Any time that development is like trotted out as like a rationale for a political project, there are people who are um, like disempowered by that, and I think a big part of, especially like thinking in in terms of like successful transnational campaigns, a big part of it has been like 
identifying those folks and like amplifying those voices. And so like the politics of how that happens are very complex, but I think that that's very essential and maybe like all of the projects that that people are talking about in this panel. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point that they are, I think they're sort of simultaneously reformulating Zionism through a language of development it, as I also talked about in my paper so that they can sort of fit in with the dominance Western with Western dominance, let's just leave it at that. Um, and they're also obscuring Zionism in that language and obscuring much of the history of Zionism, I think. So they might say that this is Zionism, but when they say Zionism, they're not alluding to all of the displacement and other histories that have also mm -hmm. accompanied that. And I think it's really complicated and I think it's really scary. And I think it's something that we have to be, I say we, I guess, with the assumption that we're coming from a shared political perspective in this room, and hopefully I'm right, and I'll just pretend that I am for now. Um, so <laughs> I, I think that we have to be really vigilant, I guess, um, and rigorous in our scholarship in looking at the ways that this discourse is being created right now and the way it's being propagated right now so that we don't suddenly 10 years from now wonder how they got so many liberals to support what they're doing so that, and so that we don't wonder. You know, like I think that a lot of, if we're paying attention, we can address a lot of these things as they're happening and not have to sort of go back and try to unlearn everything, which we have to do anyway, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here and then here and there. Go ahead. Um, I'm Dominique. I'm associated with the Columbia and CUNY Grad Center but I'm from Switzerland. So um, I'm interested in Samantha um, paper particularly, but I love all of your papers, it's excellent. And I wanted to ask about the traveling figure of the uh, breast cancer survivor, especially sort of the notion of the warrior, mm -hmm. that female masculine um, figure. Do you see differences in the way that figure is imposed or, or how it travels in the different er um, areas that you Mm -hmm. Describe because it's like such a vast area that you know, the Middle East. Well, yes, <laughs> yeah, um, and I'll, yeah. you know, it's it, I haven't done field work, right? Yeah. This is based on the um, analysis of texts that are produced through this partnership program, and then some media coverage from the region in response to it. But uh, it said, uh, <laughs> I mean, e you know, it, it's the. The survivor terminology has been well critiqued uh, uh, within the U.S. for the work that it does to, uh, well, first of all, erase differences among women in terms of their experience of the disease, but also in setting up people who die as somehow having not fought hard enough, right? It's a very individualistic and uh, liberal uh, identity category. Uh, and... Um, but as far as I can tell, it's just been taken and kind of plopped into these very different places. I mean, not just, I, I, I've also looked at this outside of the Middle East, so, you know, the, the world over, and the, the, the translation might be slightly different, but the idea uh, is the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it just in, encourages the... The the uncritical and, and, and passive uh, acceptance of this mode of breast cancer awareness that I that that I was trying to draw attention to in the in the paper, but uh, it's a yeah I, I can't I can't I can't answer in you know in ter I mean I can't I don't have an empirical answer to your question unfortunately, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's a it's a it's a good it's a good one to think about for sure. Yeah, the doctor. Yeah, sure. I'm Sherry Wolf with uh, Adala, New York, and the ISL. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I'm curious about the 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 sort of language of pinkwashing and greenwashing overall seem to attempt to appeal to progressive circles, mm -hmm. lefties, broadly speaking, on the global scale. And yet, there's been how do you account for the flip here in the United States of who actively supports ideologically and financially and all the rest of that? Zionism, which is essentially becoming more and more right-wing 
um, support. You now have liberals and progressives broadly defined who are turning away from Zionism or who's questioning it, and yet they seem to aggressively pursue these this discourse that is decisively, you know, progressive. So how, is it just sort of an utter failure on their part and they're pissing in the wind, or how do you how do you <laughs> see <It's>, that disconnect? <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the, that they see the disconnect and that they're strategizing around it. That's why liberals have been identified specifically as a target, not a target, a target audience um, for this branding mm -hmm. campaign. Is that, That's who it's focused on because it's a group that they see losing interest, becoming mm -hmm. vaguely critical, but not necessarily moving from vague criticism to actual opposition, just kind of, okay, well, we're not really interested in that. And you know, we and they're not supporting it to the same extent um, as they possibly once were. Um, and so I think that's why we have to focus on it now, you, you know, as I said, so that we can sort of not have to go unlearn it in ten years. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also um, the one audience is Zionists, and but other audiences are in the case of. Israeli pinkwashing, queer pinkwashing, or tourists around the world, right? Bourgeois tourists around the world who, and, and in that case, might be completely ignorant of, of, uh, of, of what's going on. So I think that there, there are multiple audiences for whom they're, to whom they're trying to speak in these campaigns. I actually had a question. I wanted to follow up on that because you, you brought up the language uh, piece. And, and all of you, um, I found it interesting that you took pinkwashing out of your title, right? Which is. It, it, it. Right, right. No, no. no, no but I think that, 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 that was an interesting move, and, and, it, and it, it, it only reinforced my desire to ask a question that, that, um, that we often, and I, I'm also invoking a we that's incredibly problematic, but uh, for the purposes of, you know. <laughs> I haven't had enough coffee to complicate my we yet, but uh, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> but often pinkwashing. I'll, I'll use the passive voice. Actually, that, that's even better. Uh, often pinkwashing is used, and it's translated across multiple contexts. So we've actually been using it on this panel in a fairly uncritical way. That pinkwashing is a category of analysis that makes sense, and it means something, and we can translate it to all these different arenas where certain obfuscations are going on. And I'm wondering if we, I have a couple of questions. One is, is pinkwashing a category of analysis that now has a kind of fairly universal consensus acceptance in progressive circles as a way to understand that obfuscation? Um, is it uh, unproblematic to just take pinkwashing and sort of use it, sort of wash it across a variety mm -hmm. of progressive causes when it comes to trying to advance that we're trying to advance a critique about ways that these things are obfuscated. And if we do that, if it is fine to do that, if we accept pinkwashing as a category of analysis that allows us to articulate the politics of obfuscation and imperialism and all the things that we've been talking about, um, does it then become so such a generic term that it loses the specificity that it has with respect to queer politics? If pinkwashing beyond LGBT is what we're sort of talking about here, what are the sort of consequences of taking pinkwashing beyond LGBT for LGBT and for pinkwashing? I don't have an answer. That's what the moderator does, you just sort of throw that out into the air. I, I it, mean, Brian? it was really interesting to me to hear like the history of greenwashing and thinking about like whitewashing and the number of other places where this sort of concept has come up. And I, one of the things that I worry about with pinkwashing is that it sort of does what gay issues are doing a lot in the US right now, which is just like sort of wiping away the rest of a progressive agenda and sort of taking up a lot of the media airspace. And like, I, I wonder if like the concept of washing period would be like a more useful mm -hmm. concept scrubbing. for folks to develop. Or scrubbing, which is. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like thinking, I mean, what the, the core idea in a lot of these is just, in a lot of these terms is just this concept of like using a progressive issue to distract people from your like right-wing agenda on a lot of other fronts and like I think that developing that concept as like a coalitional concept is a is a very useful move um, I don't know that it should be called pinkwashing though because of sort of how narrow that that appears yeah. and of course your conception of pinkwashing is literally using the color pink to wash over all of it right. I mean, you, you have a, 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 it has a, a more literal <laughs> well and it's not I mean it, you know it's breast cancer action and activist organization in San Francisco that that coined mm -hmm. their particular use mm -hmm. of the term, right? Yeah. So it has a different 
history and it's specifically to describe corporations that produce carcinogens or some other do you know engage in unhealthy practices and then also contribute to breast cancer fundraising and awareness so yes it it, it has a um, but I, but I would agree that uh, any category that just gets overused without being interrogated right. loses its analytical yeah. value after a while. And part yeah. of it's the historian in me too, which is which you know mm-hmm. looking at a very specific kind of historical or political mm-hmm. context and not just removing language and and experiences like the comparative social movement work right the gay is the new black no it isn't right, right. you know the, the, that that you know <laughs> that, that the prop eight cases. Loving, no, it isn't, right? And, and I resist that as a historian. I would deeply resist those kinds of uncritical and easy translations and comparisons because I actually think they do they do damage and do violence to the specific histories that we must be talking about, including LGBT specific histories, which of course is is not just one history. Right? Yeah, I, mean, I definitely didn't um, complicate the term. I actually gave like a really sort of succinct, founded definition of it, but. Um, Jezbir Puar and I think Maya Mikdashi co-authored an article in Jedaliya, which is um, online journal that uh, really complicating the term and then complicating pink watching, which is like the criticism of pink washing. Um, so if you do want to get a much more critical, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other thing I was going to say is I think that um, I mean I used the term scrubbing, which I got out of conversation with Rachel Levitt, who's going to be giving a, a, a talk later on. Um, I think during the 315 slot, but um, mm-hmm. Rachel also talks about sort of lubrication, like the way that I think some of the, the frictions, uh, like the way that these sort of tactics or strategies get rid of some of the frictions that would otherwise hold up uh, some of these agendas. Yeah, yeah. Um, just the, so the, the history of the title of my paper and taking out the term pinkwashing was actually that initially I did include more of a discussion yeah. of that and a critical discussion of that, um, but because I guess at this conference, since pinkwashing is in the title, um, that was presumed to be something that people would generally have an idea of mm-hmm. here. Um, mm-hmm. And they, the conference organizers requested yeah. that I you know, don't really cover that because there's not going to be time, as clearly mm-hmm. there wasn't for mm-hmm. anything. Um, and so, but it, it definitely, I think, the idea, for me, it's sort of about contextualizing the discourse and, and historicizing, historicizing it through those links in terms of the way that the discourse is, it is framed, like dominant discourse is framed, I think. And so it's, it's not necessarily decontextualizing pinkwashing, but context, recontextualizing pinkwashing, I think, or contextualizing it differently. Um, and, spe- and I like the term scrubbing as well, because I have been wanting to just say washing. Like, I don't know what to call it, you know, but there's this appeal to models that sort of takes the same, it's either pink or it's green, or there was a blue one, I don't remember, it's very colorful. So, yeah. <laughs> Right. And soon we'll get back to a rainbow and we'll be all right, confused. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> follow that up. Um, I'm Tay. I'm uh, currently affiliated with Princeton University. Um, I want to thank all of you for these great papers, and I really learned a lot. I, I want to just put out there one thing I took away and then ask a question that I know I'm going to get a lot from my students. Um, so doing my job for me a little bit. That's why we come to conferences, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. What do I tell yeah, them? Yeah. Um, maybe you guys do. So two things came out of these papers that I think are really useful. One, with regard to the breast cancer, um, that particular frame of pink washing is in fact this idea that um, that individual agents, be they individuals or corporations, that are actually responsible for producing a, a particular problem use the politics of solving it to their own benefit, right? Mm-hmm. So that idea is a very, very specific, very identifiable, at least, you know, I, I'm, in my mind, I'm always thinking, like, how do I teach this to undergrads? How do I make them understand? That's one way I can really easily get at that. And then in Ryan's paper, what, what I pulled from that was really the complexity of um, this relationship between intimacy and power. So I've done some work with Eagle Herc, and I've done some work with international LGBT organizations, and. Um, and it's really, it all plays out in these incredibly complex, incredibly affect-laden ways in, in personal relationships between human beings. And so these two things together 
make me understand a position that I think all of us who teach find our students in, which is you have these um, sometimes you know these these sort of university affiliated, um, in certain ways politically viable, interested, energetic students that actually want to do work to help make other people's lives better, and yet in the doing of that work, right, we we find ourselves all of us up against these same kinds of problematic imperatives. And so I wondered if I could ask you the question that I'm often asked, which is, okay, so now what do we do, right? So like, Ryan, what did you learn? What's the right way to use <laughs> language? In your opinion, if you have any, what were the successful moments of um, movement from a Western-based context to other places in the world in yeah. a supportive, scaffolding, helpful way, right? Well, how do we, what do we take from all of this? That's a huge question. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that the, some of the moments of success actually came out of some of the moments of difficulty or failure. And I think that that's one thing that gets lost in a lot of this, in, in a lot of um, critical scholarship more generally. So like in the, some of the case studies that I discuss in the paper, like, you know, after the Senegal report tanked, there was a lot of discussions with activists in Dakar about like, who are the relevant players? Like, how do we like think about inclusivity in this context? And like, working with queer women in Senegal, and like, um, would it, they ended up like trying to arrange um, like learning exchanges with activists in Cameroon who had like a very sort of differently structured movement? And there, the same thing sort of happened in like the Middle East, where there's a sort of learning tour in like the Middle East and North Africa with activists from Eglehurk who were basically just going to visit with groups and say like, in what ways can we be helpful, and in what ways are we not helpful with and, and the idea was like to not bring an agenda to that, but to just sort of learn. And so I think, I think one, one thing that I took away from Igle Herc is that these are, with these sorts of failures, and especially in some of the critical environments, it's very easy to get defensive about these things, and that there's a very productive moment that happens in queer failure where you can sort of, it, it can be very generative in another sense. And I think that's where some of the best solidarity politics emerge. I don't know how like actually helpful some of this, but that's. Oh, um, yeah, it's it's a really good question. I mean, I think for in my case, uh, this kind of breast cancer awareness is really the soft side of military intervention and occupation and um, support for autocratic regimes. So. I don't think there's any way to make this better, really. And so I think opposing those those things and and making visible, I mean, for my students who like they're we specialize in producing Victorian missionaries at my university. And uh, so they all, you know, they all want to go and help people. And so I think just sh showing them how this pr all produces ill health horrible and they're worried about health too so I think is the the first thing and and that uh, you know the uh, and if and and trying to understand like what what you know what people people people's health issues are within within that context I just don't think there's any way to uh, what's the word we something this for, say, yeah to 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 say this, yeah, and I think drawing links between breast cancer and yeah. and breast cancer incidence and mortality, like even if you want to go that way, and uh, shrapnel and that, you know, huh. bombs. Yeah. Yeah. Here, my name is Hugh, and uh, affiliation I'll stick to professional. I teach in the English department at Queens College and the City University of New York. Um, in Samantha's paper, I was struck by that sort of fact, you could say, I suppose, that uh, Suzanne Mavaric likes to have organizations named after her. Mm -hmm. But then I hit a kind of historical speed bump, because I'm assuming that if such organizations still exist, they've had to change their name. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just I want to sort of frame this for, for Samantha, but for anybody, really. Um, what are the implications of both the possibilities and maybe the disappointments of the so-called Arab Spring in terms of the kind of thinking? I mean, I'm wondering, for example, is it possible to suggest that Israel is becoming increasingly paranoid, partly because of democratic revolutions 
um, are in the surrounding countries. I mean, I was just throwing that out as one idea. I mean, I'd really like to hear mm -hmm. sort of uh, an update of the last couple of years, I suppose, from any of you. Uh, um, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess to, uh, in terms of democracy, the way that the, the term gets used by, by Israel is to say we're the only democracy in the Middle East. But when you look at um, what that actually means in the way that state operates is to, I mean, I think there's a real conflation of democracy with all kinds of other things like just capitalist, free market economics or whatever. But um, I don't know, I guess I would, I would, to go back to the previous question about like, what do we tell our students, that sort of thing. I think what like my paper is trying to do is to, to say it's not just going elsewhere to help people, right? It's about the fact that this is a settler colony, right? Like the water in this glass or the air that we breathe and the land that we walk on is all expropriated land. Um, and to think, you know, and that doesn't help students think, oh, like how can we just you know, go solve stuff? But I think that it's like the importance of that. And so then another thing would be to, um, I think in the, uh, during, so when the Occupy movement started, some Egyptian activists sent a letter to the US. It's really interesting. I think people should track it down and read it. And um, another thing that students at UNM did was during Occupy was to, to have some really tough conversations about the naming of Occupy and occupation as a concept. And um, the Occupy group in Albuquerque uh, renamed themselves De Occupy, I think, or Unoccupy. And, yeah, that's right. and it was divisive. It didn't help people think that they could just solve these problems, but it brought that problem into view as a problem. And, you know, so, I mean, I think that for me, that's what's at stake, so. Um, Anybody else? Yes, I definitely find it very satisfying, I guess, to think about how they really cannot get away with the whole, we're the only democracy in the Middle East thing anymore, um, I think. Struggle for democracy throughout the Middle East, which is a problematic term in itself, but still, um, I think has sort of made that, they, they would just sound absurd. And I haven't heard it. I've been attentive to it because I was curious at first, and then just, I haven't heard that. So that's kind of nice. It feels like a miniature victory of a kind. Um, and then I also wanted to respond to the question about teaching um, this to students and in political education work and wherever else we might find ourselves wanting to teach about it. Um, and there's a conversation going on right next door, I believe, about saving discourses. Um, and I think a crit critical of saving discourses, of course. Um, and I think that that is really relevant in terms of, of sort of encouraging people to get involved and also to incorporate that critique historically in the present, all different kinds of discourses of, of saving and salvation and and the connection between activist work and missionary work and trying to sort of intervene on that intense connection and that intense relationship. Also, you can just tell them to get involved in BDS work. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny. I, I have presented an earlier version of this paper a year or so ago, and I ended the section about the Egypt race for the cure by saying that I thought that maybe the fact that the race for the cure didn't take place in 2011 might be a testament to my sense that Coleman and the US government are only interested in working with authoritarian regimes in their region. And, and of course, that's it's, com it's really complicated now, like, you know, given everything that's unfolding and, and what will be the relationship of the U.S. state to, to, to Egypt going forward is a, is a bit unclear, and I'm also not an expert, so I don't really feel qualified to comment. But I've certainly thought about that. Um, the other thing uh, that I, I would say is a lot of these programs are actually fluff. They really are about PR for the State Department, and it's very... Hard to get a sense of, and you know, any real um, concrete stuff that emer or meaningful stuff, good or bad, that emerges out of them. But um, it's also it's interesting that medical professionals, uh, doctors and nurses, have been really at the center of some of the anti-government uh, struggles in the Gulf states. Uh, you know, people who would have been targets of these partnerships. So that there's something um, interesting, I think, there um, about 
about the way that that health uh, is operating in in uh, in relationships between the U.S. and and those states in the region. And I also think that, that oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I, I think that one of the really interesting dimensions is like how it surfaces the politics of partnership, like the whole Arab Spring and this idea of like who are our allies, who are our new allies, like should they be, should the new allies be like the relevant ally, and like the ways that the the, the rationales for partnering with different groups in different places has just been surfaced as like so politically based is, is like a very interesting aspect of the Arab Spring and how that continues to be negotiated like month after month and with, with different groups in different countries. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, hi, I'm Scott Morris and I also teach at a Victorian Missionary University <laughs> in Canada. Um, and I wanted to thank you, uh, Sammy, um, my colleague Sammy, um, for a great paper. I, my question was for Sam, actually, but I just wanted to um, appreciate you for uh, starting out my conference by taking Cheerfulness. <laughs> I can't even speak. Uh, that was nice, and I really appreciated all of the papers. Um, and Sam, I just was really—I just found your paper to be really inspiring in a lot of ways for me. And um, one thing that I've been that's been resonating for me is when you you wrap together your um, your arguments with a really compelling argument for me that greenwashing and normative critiques of greenwashing are both forms of investment in the production of settler colonial life. Mm -hmm. or, or even just to, you know, we could concentrate on the biopolitical angle if you wanted to, but really it's just that they're both demonstrating a certain kind of naturalization or investment in settler colonization. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel that so deeply when I struggle with um, with the specifically queer trans-oriented angle of pink, pink washing, um, where it's very clear that the in that frank not beyond the LGBT, uh, that, that formulation of pink washing is problematic. And then if there's a critique of pink washing, but if that critique is pink washing, and it, it doesn't necessarily, even often, but certainly not always, land there. But if it were to land right on that idea that somehow, if we could improve or fully realize the, the, the global and even universal capacity of queer trans solidarity, you know, to actually get us all to be in true solidarity with one another, somehow mm -hmm. these problems would be resolved. And, you know, not only does it not take down the whole developmental model that allows the, the, you know, the UN and the North-South and nation states to continue to exist, but it doesn't even consider the fact that queerness and transness are already colonial in this context, right. yeah. constituted that way already. Yeah. Well. So yeah. I don't know if that was a resonance for me, and I was wondering if you had more thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, if I was speaking all the citations, I would cite your work because your work's your your book's been really helpful for thinking about this sort of stuff. And um, um, I think that that it, I mean it's a it's it's really important and kind of tough to think about because there are all these ways that I mean, especially with sustainability discourse, but also with the you know, progressive queer trans work. It's there's there's a real investment like the. The settler colonial structure is sort of what enables that, right? Which is, I guess, I'm sort of almost just repeating back to what you're saying. But, <laughs> but I think that what I think what's really important is to to sort of think about the terms on which these sort of like solutions are developed, and to think about like the the sort of unmarked places from which those terms are coming from, um, how they might be marked differently if we're tuned to different places and things like that, and. Um, and one of the things that I think is really, like, if, if you're really interested in this stuff is to look at the ways that there's these really deeply entrenched sort of settler colonial um, European ways of thinking about nature that enable something like, like all the problems of the world to be resolved through this reconciliation that sustainability promises mm -hmm. that, that that's, and then again, that sort of who, I mean, with the Israeli innovation stuff and the, you know, and the, it comes from both the U.S. and Israel, they really claim um, through their national security apparatus, apparatuses and research and development stuff to really have a hold on solving all these problems that are facing the world in terms of sustainability. Like is, Israel's perfecting all these desalinization technologies that are going to solve world water crisis and um, there, you know, the 
And what that means is that Israel has a really secure future and a lot of investment coming in, right, if they can hold on to that. And the U.S. totally supports that. Like in Albuquerque, San Diego National Labs um, works with Israel really closely on these sort of things, and they're all focused on energy and water sustainability. And, and San Diego is on expropriated uh, Isleta Pueblo land. I mean, there's just a lot going on there that's that's people don't know about. Um, because, I mean, desalinization and water stuff is important, but how do you look at you know, the importance of people drinking water and then think about how can that be delivered in a different system, in a different infrastructure? Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. No more questions. All right, then I have a question. I have another question, a big question. Um, all of your papers on some level um, advance uh, a, a pretty aggressive critique of discourses of and practices of modernity. And, and embedded in any notion of modernity is this idea of progress, right? The frontier, the pioneer, the, the desert blooming, the, you know, the, whatever. I mean, all of this stuff is, is wrapped up in discourses of modernity. And yet you've all advanced quite devastating critiques on some level of that of the development international NGO world, of the of settlement and, and colonial projects, of breast cancer campaigns, of free market capitalism, all of these things that attend to these various um, discourses of modernity. And I'm wondering, what do you then replace it with? Once we've dismantled the discourses of modernity and the practices that you all find incredibly problematic and oppressive and so which I agree with as well, but what do we do what do we replace it with with respect to people who are sick, lands that are being exploited, NGOs that are on some level doing really important work, that have resources to redistribute to places that desperately need them, to people who want to live in new kinds of communities? What, do, what about to LGBT people who feel that there has been some, quote, progress made right, recently, right? What do you do if we're gonna dismantle modernity and with it narratives of progress that attend to and justify all of these forms of exploitation and oppression, what then replaces it? Do we talk about progress anymore? Do we talk about community as solidarity, a new way of thinking about things? But once the scrubbing is dismantled, what then replaces it? For people who are actually- Dismantling modernity. What? I like that you just have a okay. So once we've dismantled, there. Well, yeah. I mean, but that seems to be where you're, you're. I mean, you're all pointing to to certain dismantlings of, yeah. of of certain projects of modernity and logics of modernity. And I thought that that was one thing that was absolutely central to all of your papers. But yet, also central to all of your papers are peoples who are seeking liberation, right? Who are right now screwed in various ways by these logics and practices of modernity. So what then, if these projects are problematic and need to be replaced, what then replaces it, right? What is the aspirational, is it a return to another way of being? Is it, a, is it something we haven't yet imagined? I'm always like, I, I'm theoretical and critical and all of those things, but I'm also aspirational. I wanna know what replaces the shift that we now experience and that we're fighting against and we're resisting. What is that world like when we win? What's the start? In five minutes. Uh, <laughs> seven minutes, no. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer either, but I, I, the thing that I usually worry about when presenting papers from my dissertation is being an apologist for Igloher, because I feel like there's, you know, there's this weird sort of Stockholm Syndrome that you get when you work for an NGO. And like Lisa Markowitz has written about this idea of like studying over and like you sort of, you, you work, you research NGOs that you sort of believe in and there's all that happens. So I usually worry about being like too close. And one of the ways that I think that manifests itself is that I'm very hopeful in organ, about organizations that are very receptive to these critiques and that are like very invested in doing this work better. And I would imagine that like, to some extent in all four of the papers, there are folks who are thinking very critically about these issues who are in spaces where they can exact some change on the things that we're critiquing. And I think that it may not be sort of the, you know, it might not be like the mainstream LGBT movement, it may not be the mainstream environmental movement or um, breast cancer organizations, but like there are folks in those organizations or on the periphery who I think are receptive to challenges to do these things better. Um, and I think a lot of times they're also interested in scrapping bad tactics. And if you can sort of you know, I think critical voices that sort of say this isn't working, think of the collateral damage, like 
there are people who are also willing to sort of let some tactics of modernity go while, while rethinking the project that they're engaged in. So maybe it's not like abandoning these sort of tactics wholesale, but, but really critically refining them in, in an important way. Right. Yeah. Um, I think I was just, I'm not sure if you actually phrased it this way, but I wrote down as your question, what do we replace it with? And then I was thinking, Maybe this is a good time to drink enough coffee to be able to define the we. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> right, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, like, who who exactly, who who's replacing it mm -hmm. once we get to be replacing it, which, mm -hmm. whatever we that is, I, I mean, that sounds kind of like a lot of amazing possibility could be there. Um, also, it probably wouldn't be totally replacing it. Right. Well, I think process, a new we also, would have to be constructed, right, actually. Yeah, and I think, and that's happen. where a lot of, a question I actually had for you was um, about like the framework of partnership versus solidarity, reciprocity, alliance, and all of Mutuality. these different mutual. Yeah, there Especially are all of these different hours. sort of terms that I always hear thrown around and that I occasionally hear people making distinctions between, and I'm never fully. I always feel like oh, there's so much conversation to happen there, but it's always like raised like this at the end of something, and then it's not actually the topic of a discussion. I would like to have that discussion, I know, and I think it's really relevant. Yeah. The reason I didn't ask it right as soon as the papers were over is because I didn't want that to be the only discussion. Right. Had, but, <laughs> it um, is, but yeah. <laughs> but I'd like to have that too, yeah. You have thoughts about that? Uh, I, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't think I have much to add other than in the, the uh, you know, I, I agree with my, my co-panelists. I think other than in the, uh, the instance of breast cancer, it's a little absurd that the U.S. model of awareness is being exported all over the world because it's failed so miserably. So yeah. that there's been progress in, in breast cancer treatment and incidents and all of that is actually not true. And, and we're basically in the same situation we were um, when Nixon declared the war on cancer 60 years ago. So I think that uh, that's, it's worth pointing uh, yeah. that out in that, that specific instance. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, I mean, I I'm still at the provisional solution okay. place where I answer my favorite. All right. Okay, that's fine. All right, well, we are just about out of time. I just wanted to thank all four of the panelists for really provocative and, and brilliant papers and for all of you for engaging and asking questions. Uh, I'm sure uh, we have a break now between uh, this session and the keynote. I'm sure that folks will be happy to stay around and continue these conversations. But thanks very much for coming this thank morning. You. I'm going to drop that ball at the end, but I...